morning. I'm Alan Ruiz, and I'm an artist based in New York, working between the disciplines of sculpture, architecture, and writing. My project, Spatial Alchemy, includes multiple parts, though its central component involves leasing air rights from various properties throughout the United States, in addition to the production of a series of glass sculptural works. This project is still in its research phase, so I'd like to provide a bit of context by sharing some of my previous work, as well as several historical precedents that have informed my practice. In my work, I'm looking at the way seemingly benign, though often highly politicized spatial elements carry the potential for social critique and subversive action. Engaging histories of site specificity and institutional critique, a question I often ask myself is how do I show what is already there? This is an image of Hunter Green 1390, a sculptural intervention that mimics the ubiquitous sheds that surround construction sites in New York City. The abundance of these standardized sheds indexes the rate of real estate speculation, but we might also consider them green screens that mystify privatization, conceal labor, or as enclosures that more often than not reflect and reproduce social hierarchies. Standards are a kind of operating system which shape our built environment. Informed by the history of modernist design and the growing global economy of construction materials seen across the 20th century, these standards and the seemingly neutral ideologies they contain are key references in my work. Yet coming from my own queer perspective, I'm also interested in asking how do standards produce not only objects, but subjects as well. This is a photograph of my father, a former artist from Mexico City who immigrated to the United States in the mid-1980s and found work maintaining the floor plans of several of New York City's glass office towers. I often make reference to these standards through the use of architectural materials, repeatable infrastructures of the built environment, and I'm interested in exposing these systems, hyperbolizing them, and turning them against their function within the increasingly global network of urban development. How might these systems be hacked or perverted as a means of offering a critique of normative structures and ideologies? Yet under the current moment of resurgent authoritarianism, slow violence, new enclosures, and neoliberal experience economies, certain atmospheric conditions within the global city may deserve attention. In my practice, I'm interested in considering the spatial matrix that these ideologies and glittering buildings rest upon. For instance, given the hyperdevelopment of cities like New York or San Francisco, we might consider the way certain effervescent elements, such as light and air, have joined physical matter as commodified resources in the ongoing privatization of the urban commons. An invisible and speculative asset, air rights are a legal form of property that endow their owner with a right to develop, to build upwards, often leaving other parts of the city in shadows. Access to light and air has historically been determined by one's class position. Indeed, the window is often a recurrent site that indexes capital as well as anti-capitalist struggle. An early form of property sunlight can be seen in the window tax of 1696, a form of property taxation in Great Britain that was determined by the number of windows in a house. In an effort to avoid this tax, many owners boarded up their windows with bricks, which as a result restricted access to light and air. The Tenement House Act of 1867 and the subsequent new law of 1901 required all New York City buildings to include outward facing windows to allow for proper ventilation. And given the 20th century display window's instrumental role in the production of taste and conspicuous consumption, it's perhaps not surprising then that these windows are often shattered during periods of political unrest, marking them as sites of counter-identification with systems of oppression under late capitalism. So indeed, windows still signify a class position. This brings me to my project, Spatial Alchemy. Rather than rehearsing the binary of doer and done to, a familiar narrative that often results in the same tales of monolithic struggle, I'm curious about approaching these issues from an oblique angle in order to question what role the privileged field of art might play in engaging and transforming existing conditions. This might be called indirect action. Just as a seductive decoy might slowly reveal its insurgent perversity over time, indirect action presents ways of engaging existing conditions in order to reroute predicted outcomes. This is even more pressing as art and culture are more often than not used as lubricants for exclusionary development and gentrification. So could it be possible to use symbolic value as a medium of obstruction hidden in plain sight? 
Spatial alchemy requires the participation of a network of property owners who will agree to lease their air rights to me for $1 per month for the term of one year and a day, radically below their real estate value. The air rights lease serves as both a legally binding document as well as a social contract against luxury development, thus creating a legal intervention into the built environment and a force field against future speculation. If, as Marx said, all that is solid melts into air, then how might air be mobilized towards sculptural ends? Leasing this air from property B technically prevents a property owner from selling their air rights to properties A or C during the duration of this lease, thereby effectively placing a temporary obstruction on surrounding development. I like to think of this lease as a sort of heavy object placed upon the leasing property. We might imagine a field of leased parcels of air that when multiplied forms a massive and invisible network of properties akin to work of land art. Here the contract is leveraged to new heights with dual identities, both its legal obstruction and artwork. It's not a work simply about those structures, but it's enacted inside of them. In the suspended zone of development and pulling from the study of art, architecture, law, and urbanism, this project will disclose the transaction of air as an invisible commodity, while also opening questions about how the built environment reflects the social and personal divisions often felt on an intimate level. Shifting these power relations, spatial alchemy uses indirect action as a way of engaging existing conditions in order to reroute predicted outcomes. And while I don't often speak about my work in such personal terms, this work is in many ways indebted to my father, who could never imagine owning air rights, an asset that might be seen as out of reach to myself as an artist. Thanks very much. <laughs>